heard a story about a man uh, who was driving down the road. My mic's a little hot. Mike, if you don't mind, turn it down a little bit. Man's driving down the road, and he breaks down. His car breaks down, and uh, he's close by to a monastery, so he decides to walk to it. He goes up to the door, knocks on it, and says, hey, my car broke down. I'm really far from home. Do you think I could just stay for the night? The monks graciously accept him. They feed him dinner, and they even fix his car. But as the man tries to fall asleep that night, he hears a strange sound uh, coming from somewhere in the monastery. He falls asleep eventually, and the next morning he asks the monks, I heard a strange sound. What was it? Uh, could, you, could you tell me what that was last night? And they say, we're sorry, we cannot tell you because you're not a monk. The man is, is disappointed, but thanks them anyway for, for all they did for him and, and goes on his way. Some years later, the same man breaks down close by to the same monastery again. So the monks accept him in, they feed him, they fix his car again, and that night he hears the same noise that he heard years earlier. The next morning he asks the monks what it was, but they tell him, we cannot tell you because you are not a monk. The man says, all right, okay. I am dying to know what this sound is. If the only way that I can find out what it is is to become a monk, then please tell me, how do I become a monk? The monks reply, you must travel the earth and tell us exactly how many blades of grass there are and exactly how many pebbles of sand exist on earth. Once you tell us these numbers in return, you will become a monk. So the man sets about his task, and 45 years later, he returns to the monastery and says, I've traveled the earth. And I've found what you are looking for. There are 145 billion, 824 million, or sorry, yeah, 326,000, and this is precise, 232 blades of grass. There are 231 quadrillion, 581 trillion, 912 billion, 999 million, 129,000, 382 sand pebbles on the earth. The monks reply, congratulations. That is correct. You are now a monk. We shall now show you the way to the sound that you heard. So the monks lead him throughout the, the monastery and they finally come to a wooden door where the head monk says, behind this wooden door you will find that sound. The man reaches for the knob and the door is locked. Ha ha, very funny. Please open this door for me. The monks give him the key and he opens the door and behind the wooden door is another door made of stone. The man demands the key for the, the stone door. The monks graciously give it to him. He opens it up to find a door made of steel. He demands that key. The monks give it to him. Behind that door is another door of copper. And so it went until he went through a door of bronze, a door of silver, and a door of gold. Finally, the monk, the head monk with him says, this is the last door. The man is relieved. He unlocks the door, turns the knob, and behind that door, he is amazed to find the source of the sound that he heard. But I can't tell you what it is, because you're not a monk. This morning we continue our series, All Sufficient. During the course of this series so far, we've just been exploring the book of Colossians. The last time we were together, two weeks ago, we explored the fact that we need to worship the king. Remember, when we started, when we initially introduced this letter, the theme of the letter became clear as All Sufficient. And like I mentioned many times before, I believe that everything that we read in this letter falls within this theme, all-sufficient Christ. Jesus is all-sufficient. So within that context, this morning we will explore the mystery revealed. You might be thinking, ooh, mysterious. And you'll see why in just in a moment. But unlike the story of the monk in the monastery, you'll come away with an answer. You'll come away knowing 
what this mystery is. So let's dive right into Scripture this morning. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through 29. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but it now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Paul did not want the, the church at Colossae to miss the revealing of this mystery. Paul begins this section of, of this scripture, this paragraph here, reminding the church of all that he has personally gone through to proclaim God's word, the trials that Paul has endured, the time in prison from which he is writing, all for the spreading of the good news, the gospel, all for the benefit of the church, of the kingdom of God. Paul rejoices that the church knows Christ, but at the same time wants to continue to encourage them and support them in areas where they were lacking. He continues to, to motivate uh, so that they don't go astray, so that they don't fall uh, victim to some of the false teachers at the time. We know the, the church and, and the Christians there in Colossae had gotten to the point where they weren't quite sure that they knew what they were doing. They, they didn't know what direction they were going. They had an unclear vision. Someone, and we don't know who exactly, had begun to convince the church, and even the leaders at the church, that they weren't following God correctly. They had to, to add some more to, to the mix before they got it right. And they didn't even know if they were, were going to heaven. They were unsure of the promises of God, like they had originally been sure of. Someone, like I said, we don't know who, slipped into their midst and began to tell them that they weren't fully acceptable before God the Father. Someone was confusing them so much so that they weren't even sure of what their expectations were as Christians. They had gotten to the point where they not only didn't know where they were going, they didn't know who they were in Christ. And false teaching can do that. False teaching can be an extremely dangerous thing for any of us. To understand what was going on here in, in Scripture... And to help us to realize that back at the, the, the time of the writing of this, this letter, originally there was a spiritual battle going on. You see, the congregation at Colossae was composed of Gentiles, Gentile believers. A Gentile was just anyone who was not of Jewish descent. I'm assuming that most of us here this morning are Gentiles. That's my assumption. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Gentiles have always been despised originally, by God's people, uh, the, the, the first century Jews and, and before that. The Jews referred them to them as dogs. That was their, their nickname. There's those dogs over there. And even had worse names than that. Jews refused to spend time with Gentiles if they could avoid it. Jews wouldn't eat with Gentiles, work for them, uh, or do any sort of play or recreation of, of that nature. A, and if a Jew had to actually purchase something from a Gentile, which they had to do from time to time, it would be ceremoniously washed clean of the filth of these people who had no part in God's kingdom. So, when the church first started, uh, uh, after Christ, it's no surprise that there were no Gentiles in the, the original church. However, after the church had established itself in Jer Jerusalem, God gave... Peter, the Apostle Peter, a vision, indicating that the, the once hated Gentiles were now acceptable in his sight. They were now able to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. And uh, God sent him to the household of a Roman centurion, Cornelius, we might know this, this account, to preach the gospel to him and his family. 
these, these Gentiles. So along with Peter, some, some uh, fellow Jewish Christians followed along with him, and, and these Jewish believers uh, had every intention of showing up at Cornelius' house and circumcising the males before they were to be baptized into Christ. However, God had something else in mind. Uh, and at that time, just as it is today, there was a, a process to, to salvation in a way. Belief, repentance, confession, baptism. We follow that as well. Then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then God might grant you a, a spiritual gift. And at that time, we know that the gifts were, were active in that time in, in, in our history. However, this time, God kind of sped up the, the history with Cornelius. Sped up the process, I mean. Before Cornelius in the household could express belief in Christ, before that they could repent of their sin, before they had a chance to confess Jesus Christ before men, before they could even be baptized into Christ, God bore witness to them. And if you want to read that on your own, you can, uh, you can pick up Acts chapter 15 and read that whole account. But God chose them to be acceptable as they were in their current state. No circumcision required. So these uncircumcised, unbaptized Gentiles began to speak in tongues and glorify God. So at that point in, in Scripture, Peter turns to the, the fellow Jewish Christians who came with him and said, Can anyone withhold water from these people? So why, why would he ask such a question? What does that mean? Because that was exactly what was probably going on in, in the minds of these uh, folks who were with him. They intended to baptize these people, but they intended to circumcise them first because that was how things went according to the, the Jewish tradition. They weren't a, about to allow Gentiles to just enter the waters of baptism without first following the rules, so to say. However, once God had bore witness that, that these Gentiles were acceptable... No one dared say, we can't baptize these people. So why am, I, why am I talking about this? Why am I going on and on? Well, in Colossae, there were a number of Jews um, who might have, uh, we can assume, visited, uh, that refused to accept the Gentile way of things. They would visit a Gentile church, whatever church it might be, and demand, you must become a Jew first, before you can become a Christian. And they were, were, they were really known as the circumcisers. They would co go from town to town and, and perform this ritual in order for them to fully become Christian. And we can assume that they might have showed up at Colossae. Their message was basically this. Unless you are circumcised, unless you have obeyed the laws pre-Christ of the Old Testament, on top of everything else you were taught with Christ's teachings, you weren't saved. You, you're not a Christian, you're not acceptable before God, and you have no hope of eternal life. This, this was a, a known thing. They, they visited churches and, and preached this gospel. But Paul was telling the Colossian church that there's something that these false teachers just do not understand. There is something about Christianity that was a mystery to these false teachers. And that mystery is simply this, and it's found in verse 26 through 27. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here we have the mystery revealed. And what's that mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. In other words, the Gentile believers in Colossae, they were saved. They were already saved because they were already acceptable before God because of their belief in Christ, because of their Savior, Jesus. And the Gentile believers already had the hope of glory, eternal life. Why? Because Christ was living within them. Because Christ was living within them because the Spirit of God was on them. They didn't have to jump through extra hoops. They didn't have to perform extra rituals. They didn't have to do any dramatic deeds. They were acceptable because God viewed them as acceptable. They were acceptable 
who they are because of their faith in Jesus Christ. The mystery revealed is that Gentiles are acceptable. Gentiles are welcome into the kingdom of heaven. Now, you say, okay, I've known that. Um, this has been around for thousands of years. Got that. But today, our circumstances are similar but different. We're, we're uh, well, at least that I know, there aren't many Jewish believers that I've ever heard of visiting our modern-day congregation here demanding that we all become circumcised, at least that I know of. So you might ask, what difference does this situation that I find in the Bible that we are just read this morning have on us today? What, what does this mean for my life? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, you see, the mystery revealed wasn't just that God would accept Gentiles. That's not the only thing. The mystery wasn't just that God had changed the rule, so to say, uh, that circumcision was no longer a vital part of the covenant uh, with, with God's people. The mystery is this. God would let anyone be acceptable to him. God gives anyone a chance at becoming his child. There's no one outside the reach of salvation. The mystery was that God would allow those who were once his enemies to now become his people. We all have a shot. The mystery was that God would accept anyone, you, me, to become his child. And it's even more of a mystery that God would even accept people that sometimes we have trouble accepting to become his children as well. We all have a, ch a shot. We all have a chance. Prostitutes, adulterers, thieves, swindlers, insert whatever t title you'd like to insert. They all have the opportunity for salvation. Some might think, well, what about murderers or something of that nature? God certainly could not forgive those people. Think about all the hurt, the pain, the, the trouble, the sin that they've, they've just caused throughout their lives. And you know, I agree with you, and God agrees with you. These people do not deserve eternal life, but neither do you. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-10 through 10 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Of God. None of these people have the right to eternal life, but that's the mystery. They still have the opportunity. They still can. Paul continues telling the church in the verse that directly followed the verse that I read, verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And Paul is telling the church at, at Colossae the very same thing in verse 21 of chapter 1. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. That's you. That's me. That's all of us before Christ. So then what do you do to be acceptable before God? What can you do? What act is su sufficient enough to make God change his mind or to, to make God forgive you of his wrath? Nothing. That's the answer. Nothing. There's nothing you can do. Nothing. You can do nothing to make God change his judgment towards you, towards sin, towards discretion. That's, that's against his nature. He will punish your sin. He will punish your discretions. So then what's going to curb his wrath? What's going to point it away from us? What makes you acceptable before the Father? What changes you from being an enemy to being a child of God? Verse 21 through 22 of Colossians 1 says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds... He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach 
before him. I want you to listen carefully to what I'm going to say. Nothing you have ever done has earned salvation. Not your faith, not your repentance, not confessing Christ as Lord, not your baptism. None of that has earned, that's the key, none of that has earned you eternal life. Those are how we respond. Those are ways in which we respond to God's plan. Those are ways in which we respond to God's gift. But those responses don't do anything to earn us or make us deserve or purchase salvation. It is Christ's death on the cross that gives us the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life with the Father. Jesus is the only one who could ever present you before the Father as holy, as blameless, because he's the only one who can take your sin. He's the only one who God can punish on your behalf. He's the only one who is sinless and spotless. His sacrifice is the only one that matters. Jesus is the only one who has shed his blood so that your sins could be removed. Jesus is our only all-sufficient Savior. Don't be fooled into believing that there's something else that you can do. There's something, some other way that can make you acceptable before God. There is no other way. Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection is the only all-sufficient way to the Father. So Paul has told the Colossians that fact, and he's telling us too, many years later. And it's amazing. It's an amazing fact. But it's scary, because we all know people who don't know Jesus. It's our job to start living like it. And it's our job to start spreading this message that we know about. We need to accept it. We need to believe it. And if we've done those things, we need to start living like it. And we need to start letting others know about it as well. Don't let anyone rob you of your faith and your hope, thinking that you need to add some extra things or jump through some extra hoops or perform extra rituals by attempting to convince you of the lie that eternal life is something that you can earn because it's not. If Jesus' death on the cross is not enough for you, then there is nothing enough for you. Jesus is all-sufficient. That means he's enough. Colossians 1, 22-23 says, He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, uh, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. In other words, you will only be without blemish. You will only be uh, presented as holy and blameless before God in his presence. You will only be free from guilt and accusation of your sin if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's it. That's the only way. That's the only way. Over 20 years ago, there was a woman who was uh, out enjoying the ocean, and she lost her engagement ring. Lost into the sea. Uh, she was from, from Sweden, and just spending time enjoying the ocean, and it just fell in. It slipped off. Lost in the vast waters. But miraculously, the ring was consumed by a mussel. A little, one of these guys. And it was later found by a local uh, fisherman, a, a shellfish fisherman. And his name was Peter Carlson. And the only reason Carlson could return this ring that he just came upon inside of this muscle was because it was engraved with the woman's name on the inside. What was lost was now found because of the name written inside. And those of us who bear the name of Christ within us no longer have to fear being lost are no longer lost to sin we are found we are alive 
because of the mystery revealed through Christ Jesus, our all-sufficient Savior. Let me close this morning just by reading Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Won't you invite him to be your Lord and Savior today? If this morning you've decided to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, being baptized for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, will you make that decision today and come forward? Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for our all-sufficient Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and died and was resurrected to take away our sin. Father, let us do what we can to live our lives in constant worship of you, focused on our kingdom goals of spreading the, the gospel and living as Christ lived here on earth. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for Christ. We just pray for strength and wisdom and guidance all the days of our lives. Father, as we approach this Thanksgiving holiday, let us all make our travel safely and enjoy the time that we get to spend with family, friends, and loved ones. Once again, we thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in Jesus' name we pray.